Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon, and welcome to The Post 64, Writing Introductions. This post comes via request from Abora. Abora, it is my pleasure to deliver this request to you. And look, Abora did call me out. With all these videos I've recorded over much of the last decade, I have never done a session on writing an introduction. And there probably is a reason for that, because <laughs> writing introductions, the field itself is such a train wreck. What happens is supervisors in particular are incredibly confident that they know what their student has to put into the introduction. And invariably this confidence is accompanied by the phrase, when I did my PhD. When I did my PhD, when I did my PhD, when I did my PhD, this is what the introduction looked like. Now, nowhere else in life do we generalize from a data set of one. So let's not do that today. And it, it has a level of confidence really like supervisors are on crystal meth. So I know what's in an introduction. It's going to be fine. Let me overshare, right? So when people are on their crystal meth zone, I sort of let them get on with it. But that was a mistake on my behalf because the errors that emerge in introductions are catastrophic. When an examiner assesses an introduction and there are problems in it, a student cascades down to a 4 or a D, that is a revise and resubmit. And you understand the logic. If the student can't convey in an introduction what the thesis is about, then surely the examiner has to be cautious and careful and not have confidence in what you are doing. The introduction is a proxy for the caliber and the quality and the integrity of the entire thesis. But we hear a lot of rubbish in the sort of doctoral introduction space. For example, when you've got, you know, a, I love this phrase, a sandwich thesis. Yeah, right. When you've got a sandwich thesis, all you need is a small introduction. Okay. And of course, my personal favorite, the publications speak for themselves. You don't really need an introduction. Wow. And of course, then we've got the other problem where an introduction is described as a chapter. Okay, so, so like the introduction is chapter one. No, it's not. Introduction, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, etc. And conclusion. The introduction and the conclusion are not chapters. The introduction introduces the chapters. Okay, so the introduction of a PhD has a great deal that is in common with the introduction of a scholarly monograph. So if supervisors have not written a scholarly monograph, you see the problem. We talk a lot about research training. Well, actually, the great gift of a PhD is it provides research training to write the introduction for a scholarly monograph for a book. But the difference between a scholarly monograph and a PhD in terms of introduction, in terms of the whole project, is really with regard to the SOC, the Significant Original Contribution to Knowledge. And the doctoral thesis requires a lot more attention to the relationship between method and methodology and methodology and epistemology than exists in a scholarly monograph. We can take it as read that a scholarly monograph the the scaffolding is in place in a phd you really need to show the breadcrumbed trail for your examiners but as we know we've got some problems in the supervisory space at the moment because we've now got supervisors that did their phds 10 20 30 years ago and haven't kept up with professional development haven't kept up with the transformation of the doctorate in terms of the sociology of the people that are doing it and the diversity of modes and i understand that very very busy academics and so professional development is probably the last thing they would like to do but the consequences of that is that they overgeneralize their data set of one when they did their phd and the challenge of that is if you dud the introduction you've dudded your book <laughs> and you've also dudded your thesis so for this week's post i read a lot of pretty mediocre 
refereed literature about how to write an introduction and I went to some of those how-to guides you know and they're okay there's some okay books there how to write a thesis how to write an introduction so I did all of that stuff but I also used a very singular data set you know I've been a Dean of Graduate Studies and Research for about a decade and I've read thousands thousands of examination reports and that's a very unusual data set and I have read every one of those reports and I have taken notes from every one of those reports so I returned to my notes from the last decade to explore what examiners said went wrong with the introduction and you're about to hear some of those data sets as well so let's talk about how to write a truly brilliant exciting fantastic introduction and as I said the what I'm talking about today has about an 80% overlap of how to write an introduction for a book. So if you get this down and you get this sorted, you'll be able to write a book with ease. And pick the tips that are useful to you. The first tip I've put in the stuff, the mandatory stuff that has to be there. And with the rest of the Taurus 10 tips, the nine remaining tips, pick the components that suit your particular discipline, methodology, and protocol. So let's do it. Taurus 10 tips to writing a brilliant introduction. Tip one, what elements must be included in an introduction? So let's start with really the mandatory requirements. What needs to be there? What the examiners are looking for? And if they don't see it, they start to worry. Remember that the introduction must frame your thesis and frame your book for its audience. Now in a PhD, the audience are two or three examiners, full stop. So you need to configure a frame for those examiners that is really clear. It has to be clear in terms of focus, direction, and purpose. What are you doing here? Why are you doing it? Why now? Those questions have to be answered. The focus matters. What are you talking about? What are you not talking about? And you know, I get my students about page three or four of their introduction to specify what I am not talking about in this PhD. That's really important. We're going to come back to that again. The reason I'm so fixated on that particular page for my students, what they're not talking about, is that also calms examiners because examiners are then not spending 100,000 words looking for something that's not there. And the example I always use is, let's say a student is doing, uh, I examined this thesis, let's say a student is doing work on resilience, right? And they've left out organizational resilience and the remarkable research from David Chandler. So if they had said on page four that they're not exploring organizational resilience and they've made a decision to not investigate David Chandler and why they've made that decision, I would have calmed the farm. But of course, I was spending 100,000 words going, why has organizational resilience been cut out of this thesis, right? So if I've got that question hanging for 100,000 words, that means at best, you're going to get a three major corrections. Calm the examiner down at the start. What are we not talking about? This is why we're not talking about this. Cool. Let's enjoy the journey. Rock and roll. Now, this tip is also described as scope and scale. Explaining to the examiner your scope and scale. And remember, I read those thousands of examiner reports through my career. And the students that end up with a four or a D, so revise and resubmit, it's a master's thesis or it's a fail, every single examiner use the phrase scope and scale. This thesis is lacking scope and scale. So let's talk about what that means. That means you are, you must explain and you must justify the framing of your thesis. The introduction has to focus on the relevance of your research. How does this topic slot into current debates in your discipline? And if you are going to use words like interdisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity, and postdisciplinarity, you need to show that with meaning. About one in two theses these days use the word interdisciplinary. And when I ask students in Aviva, dude, you're talking about interdisciplinarity, what disciplines are you using here? And inter, what are you building through the relationship? and answers very rarely emerge. So be careful and cautious. If you are using words like interdisciplinary, explain what the disciplines are. Okay, you must present your research questions 
your research objective or your thesis statement and or all of those depending on your disciplines. So from the research questions, research objectives or thesis statement, what is your SOC? Your significant original contribution to knowledge. Must be there, we'll talk about that in a second. And finally, present the overview of your structure. How is the structure of this thesis going to reveal your SOC? Go through each chapter, explain what's in each chapter, but most importantly, explain the relationship between them and how they scaffold to the SOC. Right, easy. They're the components, you do that, we're living the dream. Brilliant. But let's now, if it's helpful, add a few more details to those components too. When do I write the introduction? Okay, this is where we start to get into a crystal meth zone, right? Supervisors are very wedded to when they think a student should write an introduction. And they're basically in two camps. Students need to write the introduction at the beginning or the larger group, students need to write the introduction at the end. Now, both are wrong. Team, what you need to do from the first day of your candidature is open up, have an open, living, breathing file called introduction, called conclusion, called abstract. You write all three all the way through the thesis. So when you've got these open documents, that allows you on any given day, if you suddenly discover an amazing sentence, and it will happen, oh, that's what I'm doing. And you grab that sentence and you put it in the introduction. So your introduction, like your conclusion, like your abstract, they're filled with mythical, magnificent, amazing sentences. So you know that gee whiz moment it happens to all of us. Ah, oh, that's what my thesis is on. Ah, oh, that's what my research shows. That can happen, trust me, at any point in the candidature. <gasps> Magnificent. Now that sentence, when it emerges on any given day, goes straight to the pool room. My apologies for the Australianism there, for those of you that haven't seen the outstanding Australian film, The Castle. But when you've got one of those truly precious sentences, you go, oh, and you carry it straight to your introduction. Now, obviously, you can't finish the introduction or the conclusion or the abstract until you've finished all the meat and potato chapters. Obviously, you need to have outputs. What, what have you done here before you can finish the introduction? We know that. But please avoid the following. When supervisors are saying, oh, the introduction is the last thing that you write, think about students, hi, think about students at the end of the candidature. You are absolutely exhausted, right? And you're probably getting close to overtime. You've got the time pressure on you. You've got all the people from graduate centers and graduate research going, you've got to finish by this date. And of course, by the end of the thesis, you have run out of words. You can't even say your own name. There, there are no consonants left. So in that state, <laughs> You can't write an introduction. So from the first day of your candidature, have those open files, and when a precious sentence is downloaded into your brain, add it to the introduction all the way through. These are living documents. Three, the best introductions present the limitations to your research. This part of the introduction is crucial because it's about precision and it confirms the rigor of your research. So yes, you've done the, se the section, you know, what am I not talking about? That's fine. But the best theses overtly confirm their scope and scale. And if you can use the phrase scope and scale. And what the scope and scale section does is discuss the limitations of your research. Here we go. Now, this is not admitting intellectual weakness, or I think that's a good thing too, but it's not admitting weakness as such. It's simply confirming your intellectual rigor and your ethical transparency. Right. So what I need you to do is discuss your constraints. 
they may be budgetary. So you only had a certain amount of bean time at the synchrotron, right? So there may have been budgetary constraints. So that's cool. It might be a constraint of time. So you could only do three field work trips rather than four or five. Talk about those limitations. And the constraint may also be you made errors. That's great. Acknowledge them. You are a PhD student. Remember, you're in a thing called research training. You're being trained. And when we're trained, we make errors. And that's cool. Acknowledge them. Now, trust me, examiners love it. They love it when students admit errors and weaknesses and flaws and constraints. They love it when stuff goes wrong and you need to get your hands in the wrongness and wash in the wrongness and overshare the wrongness. Because I'll tell you what the wrongness means. The wrongness, your awareness of what went wrong, demonstrates your rigor. The key is get ahead of the issues, get ahead of the problems, put the problems into the work, because of course in a PhD, the problems are the work. So say your focus was really narrow. No problem, acknowledge the narrow focus, explain why that narrow focus was selected and why it is useful. So explore the limitations in your introduction. And by the way, this might be a limitation of methodology as well, and that's cool. Remember, methodology is different from methods. Methods are the how. Methodology is the why of the how, why you've made that decision about methods, okay? And the bit that our students so often forget is, you know, they go on and on and on about methodology. But the, the reason you're talking about methodology is because every methodology and every method can access particular data sets, develop particular data sets, but through your methodology selection, there are particular data sets you cannot access. And so acknowledging the limitations of your methodology, examiners love it because it demonstrates you understand research design. Yeah. So one of your limitations may be generalizability. That is very common. So perhaps you studied a particular town, a particular location, a particular historical period. That's fine. Discuss that capability for generalizability. And it's not a problem if it's not generalizable. Not a problem at all. But acknowledge it at the start. Examiners love and are excited by your limitations because it shows you are an ethical researcher and that's part of the criteria that we have to assess your thesis and you on okay four remember to stress the why of your research now the what the how and the when questions are very very easy questions why questions are much more difficult your introduction must answer the why question why are you doing this research? Why was this research not done 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago? And why you? Why are you here doing this research? Why is this meaningful for you? Why does this research matter? So yes, you can go into impact and engagement if that's your particular disciplinary protocol, particularly in the applied social sciences and applied sciences. That's great. Impact engagement. But it may be meaningfulness. It may be mattering. That's great too. But make sure somewhere in this introduction, the why questions are answered. Five, the quality of the writing in the introduction matters a lot. Now, I've heard some horrific stories from supervisors. And let me, let me do the folk tale. The particular supervisor in particular disciplines is terribly interested in the publications that emerge from the thesis because they're authors <laughs> on the publications that emerge from the thesis. And they're not terribly interested in the thesis itself. They're just interested in getting the publications out of the thesis, out of the research, because they're co-authors on it, right? And the whole point of the candidature is to grind out every last publication from the student. Okay. 
And then, of course, what happens is the institution, particularly institutions now, are aware of this situation. So they're monitoring, they're regulating this situation. And so at a certain point, the supervisor and all the student is brought in and said, right, I'm sorry, you've got one month. You, you know, you've had a good run. You've been enrolled a very, very long time. And we need to finish this up now. And so the student may be about to be removed from the institution if they don't finish quickly. Okay. So at this point, the argument from this particular oeuvre of supervisor, so supervisors is, oh, look, just write a quick introduction, just write a quick in introduction, and it'll come back as minor corrections. Don't worry about it. Whew. Now, this is wrong, 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 and that advice destroys lives. Okay, so after the bibliography reference list and the abstract, the introduction is actually the deal breaker proxy for the examiners. The introduction has to be well constructed. So use all the headings that I've talked about in Tara's first tip, make them bold, make them clear, and really get the headings out there so it drags in the examiner. But clarity is crucial. You've got to draw in your reader, draw in your examiner, make them interested and make them feel comfortable that you're competent. That's what an introduction does. Make sure you've got the following sentences in your introduction somewhere. You present the field of your research, the specific research interests, issues, and problems, and present the structure of the thesis in the introduction. Now, also make sure that the definitions are presented really early. Do not leave assumptions hanging in your introduction. Make sure that your concepts, your theories, and your tropes are really clear. Six, be clear on the problem that you're trying to solve and mind the gap. <laughs> think about the problem that you're addressing and think about how you're solving it. At its most basic, that's what the intro does. Here's a problem and here is how I'm going to solve it. Cool. This is great for your thesis. It's great for a book. It's great for life. I always remember my great former boss, Professor Robert Saint. Hi, Rob. Now, Rob was a great human being, is a great human being. And in interviews for jobs, he used to ask this question. I remember the first time he asked it, I was like, that is the most brilliant thing I've ever heard. But he used to ask in interviews, what problem is your research solving? What a great question. I love this question. What research, what, what problem is your research solving? Great. The capacity to be able to connect your research, your thesis with a trajectory, with an outcome connected to something is very difficult to do, but it's also brilliant. So put that, if you can, into the introduction. Remember that the best research problems <laughs> don't have a consensual answer. There's a lot of debate. There's a lot of ah, 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 a lot of fighting in the car park. That's great. We we don't want consensus. We we want discussion and debate. That is what academic life is, colleagues. So this problem, you've got here's a problem. It requires research questions to answer and address that problem, and your thesis, your book will answer it. So therefore, in the introduction, present the gap in the research. Present the gap clearly. So the order can go as follows. You present a research problem. Here is a research problem. Show the big contributors of the research area. Names, darling names. Talk about the crew that are really working that problem. And then specify the gap in the management of that problem. Then your research questions come from the gap and the thesis answers them. Great. Let's move to seven. Let's do it. Sock time. This is how you get your examiners nice and comfortable and cool in the first hour of reading your thesis. The definition of a PhD is a significant original contribution to knowledge. A master's degree does not have a sock. A PhD does. And trust me, as an examiner, it is a horrific experience when there is no sock, there is no originality, and we have to grant the student a master's degree because they haven't confirmed a sock. Okay, now team, on, on the channel, on our channel, there's 
all sorts of videos on the SOG, all the keynotes I've done around the world. So if you want to do a SOG, there's plenty of stuff, 20 minutes, put headphones on, write your SOG. But just remember that each word is different, okay? You need to start with originality. And the originality emerges from your gap in the research and from your research questions. What did you discover? Remember, this is the part of the introduction. Have a sock heading. This is the part of the introduction that you write, obviously, after you've got some data. So once you've got the data, you can't do anything to you've actually got your outputs and outcomes, right? Once you've got that, write the sock. So what did you find that was original, specific, great, live in the dream? Now, you need to then situate that originality in a knowledge system, the K. Situate the originality in a knowledge system, or indeed an interdisciplinary gig if you're doing that. And that then shows your contribution, the C, contribution to a knowledge system. So originality in a knowledge system, and then the contribution to that knowledge system. Great. Now, remember that the reason that a PhD is called a thesis is because it needs to have a thesis. It needs to have an undergirding argument to it. Now, this is often called in the humanities in particular, a thesis statement. And colleagues, I did my PhD 30 years ago. I am close to death, 30 years ago, right? And when I did it 30 years ago, what we required was a thesis statement. So we all talk about SOC now. SOC, I'm so old, SOC wasn't even invented. <laughs> But, but PhDs have a history, colleagues, and they change. And 30 years ago, you had to specify a thesis statement, right? Now, so and you put it in one sentence. What are we doing here? There's your thesis statement, one sentence. Now the SOC is required. And of course, it is a SOC. We haven't done the S. Significance is the hardest one to do because it is the most subjective. So answer a series of my classy questions to try and provoke you into getting significance. Why should I care? Why should I give a damn? Why should I spend five days of my life reading your thesis? At the end of my life, I'm going to need those five days. I'm going to say, why did I read that thesis? And I need to have an answer. So why should I care? That's your significance. And this mattering can be to a discipline, to a particular knowledge community, to an industry. It can transform an industry. It can improve practice. We see that very often in allied health and in education. But it can also be blue sky science, respect to colleagues. It can also be high theory. All of that's brilliant. So immerse yourself in the SOC. Take the time. Construct the heading and prove to the examiner that you've got it going on. You've got a sock. Eight. Here we go. Outline your thesis. Now, team, we're nearly home. You've got the sock sorted. That's great. That's the most exciting bit of the introduction. And then we go to the most boring bit of the introduction. This is the structuring bit. So in this thesis, I'll do the following. In chapter one. In chapter two. Chapter three. Okay. Yawn, 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 yawn. Now, the way you enliven this procedural part is I want you to think about this like Google Maps or indeed for the Waze crew out there, respect to the Waze crew, think about Waze. So, okay, you put your address where you're trying to go into Waze, right? And you can just sort of follow, you know, turn left and then go 100 metres and turn. You, you can follow the Waze or you can actually get a sense of your actual journey. And so you pinch out and you can see the entirety of the trip. And so at least then you're not sort of reliant on <laughs> being a, you know, a woman saying, turn left. If suddenly you lose your sense of what's going on or you lose the Wi-Fi, then at least you know where you're going. So that's what this, this section does. It, it pinches out so you can see the entirety of your, your doctoral journey. And that creates a really interesting outline to your thesis. It's not sort of one damn street after another, one damn chapter after another, because it's the connections between the streets that gets you to your destination, just like it's the connection between your chapters that creates a great PhD. So yes, there is a summary of what's in each chapter, but 
don't make that more than four sentences. So in chapter one and have four sentences, but then, and this is so hard to do, but it's a blessing, try and link together, provide that connective tissue between the chapters, even in the introduction. Nine, the conclusion of the introduction. Okay, you are about to unleash your reader, your examiner, into your thesis or into your book. What final instructions do you want to give your reader, nay, examiner? What is going to be required to orient them into this research? So the final three paragraphs of an introduction are your single most important opportunity to be the tour guide through your own thesis. So what are the highlights? What's exciting? What's coming? Come on! Yeah! Okay, what's coming? Great. Also, what are the trip hazards? What are the hazards that are going to emerge in the next few chapters? So the conclusion of your introduction is your last opportunity to provide a framework, a door, if you will, so that your examiner walks through it. Why does this project matter? Why now? Why you? And I want you to be courageous, outward, positive, and focused. Cool. And 10, introductions for the special modes of thesis. Now, I've talked pretty well there about the traditional thesis. And my final point, I just want to make sure we're talking about the non-traditional theses, PhD by prior publication, but also the artifact exegetical thesis, right? These are rare theses, but they're becoming less rare. They're running at about 10% of a lot of universities, but they are increasing in number. Now, the introductions for these particular modes are very challenging and they can offer some really insightful information for the traditional mode as well. So for the PPP, and a big shout out to all the crew doing a PhD by prior publication, you have the hardest introduction to write, full stop. The PPP, remember, has all the publications published before the enrolment. So the introduction is much, much longer. It's often called a contextual statement. It's about 15,000 to 20,000 words in length, whereas a conventional introduction in a traditional thesis is about 8,000 words, maybe going up to 10, maybe. Now, the sections that become really, really big in the PPP introduction are obviously the SOC, because what you've got to do, and this is so hard, is you've got to connect up articles, chapters, conference proceedings, nitros, whatever's being presented that were produced way before you enrolled in the PhD. And you've got to knit them together to create a sock. Now, these articles may have been written and often are written over many, many years. I've seen a lot of PPPs done, research written over 20 years years and they must be bound together to show a significant original contribution to knowledge. So the context around these articles, these nitros, is incredibly important. The how they were written certainly, but then you've got to find other proxies for significance like citations and use, use by industries, use by professional organisations. These have to all be logged and presented in the introduction. So what you're trying to do, the goal is to align disparate publications into a singular research project and prove the SOC. Cool. So the introduction is really doing heavy lifting in the PPP mode. And for those of you who are in the traditional thesis, there may be some variables there about impact and engagement and citations that are helpful to you as well. And let's also therefore finish off by talking about the artifact exegetical thesis, the thesis that has the most complicated pathway through examination, most split decisions uh, and crazy split decisions. So straight through and fail. So a lot is going wrong in this mode of doctorate. And a lot is going wrong with this mode of doctorate, starting with the introduction. 
So the exegesis from the Greek explanation is about 40,000 words in length. And the other component of the thesis is an object or a series of objects or artifacts. So a novel, novella, epic poem, film, soundscape, podcast series, performance, design, piece of furniture, you get the deal. So the key imperative of this introduction is to ensure the binding, the connection between the disparate objects and this exegesis. This introduction must focus on the why of the PhD research and also why this mode of thesis. Unfortunately, this exegesis tumbles very quickly into talking about the how, how the artifact was created. So let's use the novel as a great example. So endlessly, whew, these exegeses talk about how, let me just tell you, I've just read your novel and like, let me just tell you how it's written. You know, let me just tell you, let me just, just tell you how, how much pain I went through to write this novel. With the greatest respect, this is about research. It's not about the pain, the creative pain you went through. This is research. You need to talk about why the novel was written and why it is offering a contribution to research. And of course, the connection to the sock must be the centre of the introduction in this exegesis. Now, because of the tight word length, it's 40,000 words, you've got to keep really focused on the research component of this exegesis. Remember, you are focusing on artifacts. It's not art. No one cares about art. It's not art. It's artifacts. These are research objects. And the sock matters rather than platitudes about creativity. Now, I'm not saying creativity is not important, but if you want to make a film, make a film. If you want to write a novel, write a novel. This is a PhD program. So different requirements and regulations are in place. And your introduction really matters when you're confirming the research derived from your artifacts. So as you can see, both of these unusual theses have specific problems with the introduction, but may also provide a spark and a bit of momentum for you in the traditional thesis as well make the connections, show the value of the research and look at it as a whole rather than as a disparate set of papers. Now, introductions matter because you matter and great introductions are the moment that you take an examiner, take a reader by the hand, you relax them and you encourage them and welcome them to follow your argument. The PhD is brilliant training. It is brilliant research training. But one thing we rarely talk about is it is great training for the creation of a scholarly monograph, a book, the gold standard of research. So it's worth the time, it's worth the energy, and it's worth your commitment. I wish you love, light and peace. Tia.